I'm thrilled to welcome our next guest to the show. Chris Matheson is an author and screenwriter whose screenwriting credits include Rapture Palooza, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and, of course, their subsequent bogus journey. He's also an accomplished director and the author of a new book titled The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. Chris, welcome to The Scathing Atheist. Uh, thanks. Nice to be here. So I have to warn you at first that I am a big fan of your work. Um, yeah, Bill and Ted came out when I was about 12 or 13, saw it with my best friend who was in the band that I was in that was going to be famous as soon as we learned to play our instruments. Uh, <laughs> this is the movie that introduced me to my single greatest comedy influence in George Carlin. I, just, I had a ton of reasons to love that flick. Um, now, obviously, I brought you on to talk about your new book, but I don't think I can make it all the way through the interview without at least one Bill and Ted fanboy question. So uh, do you mind if we just get that out of the way first? Not at all. Okay, so uh, this question is actually about the sequel, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Um, now, this was a movie that came along at about the same time in my life as I was being introduced to Douglas Adams, Kurt Vonnegut, Monty Python, comedy that you know treated religion with irreverence, if not downright mockery. And of course, in Bogus Journey, you have your characters going to hell, going to heaven, beating the Grim Reaper at Battleship, um, at the very least lightly lampooning a lot of Christian mythology in a PG franchise. Uh, so, especially after reading the story of God, I'm curious if there was any pushback from the studio on that, anything that you wanted to include in those parts of the movie but weren't allowed to? The movie was originally uh, titled Bill and Ted Go to Hell. Uh, that was what Ed and I uh, wanted it to be called, uh -huh. and that's what it was called, I think, even through production. And they backed off from that. And originally, we had a lot more in hell. They There was a... There, uh, adventure in, in hell, which they liked, which was frustrating to the demons um, and the devil because they're Bill and Ted and they right, were just right. excited and upbeat no matter where they are. And they, they were excited about the big rocks that they were sentenced to pound away at eternally. Um, so they were in hell more and they were in heaven more. And um, originally they were going to, the characters that were going to come back, you know, it, it <laughs> it ended up in a sort of out of left field comedic fashion that a Martian scientist is their accomplice in act three, which is, you know, bizarre. Even when I think back on it, right. it's kind of funny, but it's bizarre. Originally it was going to be biblical figures. There's a draft somewhere where basically Moses and, and Noah and uh, I, I don't know who else, uh, you know, Abraham are, are there. They're the ones who come really? back in act three and are uh, accompanying them on their whole uh, doing, you know, whatever Moses parting cars on a freeway or something like that. Right, right. And, and maybe that was a little bit too irreverent for the studio. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why we ended up changing that, or it might've just been honestly that they felt just like, it felt like a repeat that they were historical figures again, because oh, right, they kind of are, right. they kind yeah. of just feel like historical figures. So you know, let's throw a Martian in instead, I guess. But yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the same interests that go that far back. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's turn to your new book, which, by the way, I'm also at risk of being pretty damn fanboy about. Um, <laughs> now, this is going to sound like bullshit to everybody who hasn't read the book, but I very literally laughed out loud before page one in this book. And I would challenge any of our listeners to make it further than that without at least a chuckle. Um, now, to be honest, I don't think that I could do the premise justice. So I'm just going to leave that to you. What is the story of God? I wanted to tell the story of this character from Genesis to Revelation. I wanted to follow him on his whole emotional journey and see if I could piece together a character who made sense to me. I was for a variety of reasons, sort of drawn to the Bible I, from a comedic standpoint, it, there's a lot of really great found comedy in the Bible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite funny to me. As long as you don't take it seriously. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you take it seriously, I don't understand that. I, I, I find that kind of hard to grasp myself, but I, at a certain point thought, I want to try to get inside this guy's head or at least be on his shoulder. And, make sense of him. Who, his behavior is so bizarre. He's so volatile. He's so horrible and destructive and, and, and strange and, and hard to understand. He's just kind of all over the map. He seems deranged. And then, and then he, he gets a little bit nicer at times. And, and I, and I wanted to try to 
find a coherence to it. What, what is the deal with this guy? What is wrong with this guy? What is motivating this guy? What, why does he do the stuff that he does? So that was, that was the um, uh, impetus for writing the book. And, and so what did you learn about God? What, what, is the, uh, what are the, the threads that tie him together? Well, I think that there's uh, an underlying, I think there's three ways of looking at him. And uh, one of them is he's just kind of a fraud. He's kind of the Wizard of Oz. He doesn't really have all the power that he says he does. He's just kind of a big fake. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of funny. I, I find, and there, and there is certainly evidence in the book to, to back that up. The second is he's kind of a fool. He, he does have all the power. But he's really not that bright. It's sort of a universe created by a guy who has an IQ of 98. You know, he just makes a variety of boneheaded decisions and then he gets mad at himself and frustrated and, you know, basically, you know, kicking the ground like and and move and, and tries again, and makes another stupid mistake. And then the third one, which I think is the most compelling and the, and, and the most um, deeply rooted in the text is that he's he's a freak. He's there's something deeply self-hating about mm-hmm. this character. Uh, he hates us. We're made in his image. He pretty much hates all of us. And we're... Even the ones you know, he likes, yeah. Yeah, even the ones he likes, he hates. He hates, I mean, arguably, given the way he punishes them, you'd say he hates them most of all. I think I think there's a deep uh, self-hatred. And I, th- I ended up feeling a, a weird kind of um, sympathy for this character at a certain point, because I thought, what a horrible reality right. that is. If you play it out, what a, what a really excruciating loneliness there is to this job, right? I mean, there you're all alone. You have no friends. You have no mother. You right. have no father. You have no siblings. You have, you know, your son, is, well, you never even really meet him and you've basically murdered him. You know, that's like, <laughs> hey, son, nice to meet you. You know, I just tortured and killed you, basically. A rough icebreaker, yeah. Yeah, and so you're never touched. You can't be touched. You can't have any contact. And you have one, you have no friends, but you have an enemy. You know, you have one enemy. That's it. That's all you've got. And uh, I think that it sort of drives him mad. I think there's a sort of an incipient mental illness almost from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it comes to full fruition in Revelation where you just think, wow, this guy's gone, man. This guy's gone. This guy's blown out. He's a he's a complete um, James Bond villain at this point. Right, right. Now, one of the things that I loved about it is just by making uh, God into a uh, repressed, self-loathing homosexual, you explain so much about the book. Yeah, you know, to the degree that God has a sexuality, mm-hmm. and of course he does, right? I mean, he's a male. We know he's a male. I mean, that's that's stated. Mm-hmm. And he's very interested in sex. It's not like he never talks about it. It's not like, a, you know, it's not like, no, that's that's beneath him. No, he talks about sex a lot. He's very, very interested in sex. And and balls in particular, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah penises and balls he's very particular about how he wants them to look and he's very particular about perfect balls perfect balls and <laughs> balls have to be just absolutely perfect and he's got a very specific idea of how penises should look and you know he's all he's all over that stuff and and no interest in women right mm-hmm. women are just kind of gross you know like women are just sort of uh, they're icky and he you know that's just they're unclean they're and and then when you get into sort of his his taste, it's really queeny. I mean, he really does have kind of queeny taste when he starts talking about what he wants his temple to be. All the little cherubs in the purple fabric that he wants everywhere. Yeah, yeah, pom- yeah. yeah uh-huh. pomegranate right. blue fabric and gold balls. And it's just like, wow, man, you're, you get really, really gay taste. And then as any really uh, deeply repressed homosexual does, I think, he hates homosexuals. Mm-hmm. He hates homosexuals. Oh my God, he hates homosexuality. I mean, the whole Sodom thing is just craziness because he never even said homosexuality was wrong up to that point. He never said a word. Right. He just nukes them. <laughs> and the women too. Yeah. Like, what's the deal, man? What are you doing? They're like, are the women all lesbians? I mean, he doesn't give a shit if they are or not. I, he doesn't care. Right. He doesn't even bother to know their names of the uh, of the women that play pivotal parts in his story. No, never. No, I mean, so few women even get, I mean, even Eve, even Eve, yeah. God doesn't, God doesn't give a name to. Fucking Eve, you know, Adam has to name her. He just calls her woman. 
Noah's wife doesn't have a name. Of course, Noah's sons have names. Mm -hmm. Noah's wife. She's kind of an important character, right? No, I guess not. She doesn't get a name. I, I thought one of my favorite moments in the book was a, a very subtle bit in there where uh, he's when he goes to visit uh, Abraham and forgets his wife's name, starts calling her Rachel, and uh, even though her name is clearly Sarah elsewhere in the book. Yeah. It's one of those things that I guess if you know the Bible well enough uh, uh, is, is really going to hit you a lot. And I guess that, that leads me right into my next question. is uh, How familiar were you with the Bible going into this? Well, I was I, I read it I think in my twenty late twenties because I because I just wanted to, because I was curious. And I it you know, it definitely struck me. I thought it was pretty interesting. And then I picked it up again uh probably about five years ago. And this time it hit me hard and I thought, Wow. <laughs> wow, this is incredible. This is an amazing book, and if you like comedy Man, you have just stumbled onto the ultimate gold mine because it's so it takes itself so seriously, right? You know, that's what that's what makes it really funny. Mm. Like this isn't funny. This isn't funny. You shouldn't laugh at this. Uh this is dead serious. This is truth. Capital T truth. Of course that's what makes it really funny. Right. And it's filled with utterly ridiculous unfathomable behavior by uh by god and some funny human characters too but i I wasn't that familiar with it uh up until about five years ago now i i might be cheating a bit here because i might already know the answer to this but was there one particular part of the bible that you were most looking forward to uh like reinterpreting yeah definitely uh i i adore the book of job because um it's well it's generally perceived or commonly perceived to be this crown jewel of the Bible, right? That mm-hmm. it's this beautiful, poetic, deeply insightful work that 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 gets at the roots of you know of good and evil, and it's a theodicy, and and it's like why do bad things happen to good people? And of course, none of that's true. The Book of Job is 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 absurd. I mean, he's the God of the Book of Job. He's a character really worthy of of Swift or Voltaire. I mean, they could not have written this guy better because he's a, he's a bully, he's a braggart, he's a lightweight, uh, he's incredibly shallow and mean. The whole thing is just basically a party bet with Satan. Right. You know, why do evil things happen to good people? Well, because God makes a party bet. With Satan, <laughs> that's why. And and then most fascinatingly and hilariously, he has a complete nervous breakdown at the end. Like somehow. The knowledge that he's lost this bet, because he clearly does lose the bet, right. makes him flip out, and he just starts talking a bunch of crazy shit in the end about his pet sea monster and <laughs> unicorns and how lightning talks to him. And, you know, it's just beautiful. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, my co-host describes that as God's drunken stepfather rant, and uh, yeah. <sighs> Absolutely wow. bizarre. Now, one of the things that I loved the most about the book was that the narrative didn't just incorporate the contradictions and moral atrocities of the Bible. In a lot of ways, the narrative actually rose out of those things. That that actually informed it. And I thought you did a brilliant job weaving together some of the most absurd passages. But it, it also left me wondering if there was anything that you wanted to squeeze in from the Bible, but it just wouldn't fit into your narrative. <sighs> Good question. Good question. I. I wanted to get all of the stuff that I thought was the funniest. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of what I went for. Uh, I, and everybody cherry, you know, the Bible. Everybody who reads it because it's such a massive book, depending on what they're looking for, they cherry pick, right? That's that's what you do. You cherry pick, right. and the cherries that I was picking were the funniest bits. So, did I have to leave out any really? You know, maybe early on, um, Genesis has been gone over. I wrote a lot about the Garden of Eden, uh, the Garden mm-hmm. of Eden and, and the serpent and how ludicrous that is. And and to some degree, that's ground that's been gone over a decent amount because it's so early in the book, I think. And so I trimmed that way back. I mean, I could have gone on for 15 pages about that thing because it's because it is sort of the beginning of the weirdness. Like why? What kind of freak has a big plan a beautiful, a perfect plan, and then right at the very beginning introduces their own worst enemy into it and lets them fuck it up. Like, what is what? What right. is wrong with you? Now, yeah, I did notice that it seemed like on those 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 parts of the Bible that had really been picked over by comedians before. You 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 just kind of did 
a, a very little on like things like Noah's Ark and the Ten Commandments and how bizarre those are. Of course, you obviously brought those up in the book, but didn't dwell on those as much. And I assume that that was why, because so many other comedians had been to that ground before. Yeah, that was why. That was why, because I thought, well, you know, this has been th these bits have been looked at quite a lot. And, um, you know, Ricky Gervais has has uh, he's fantastically funny and uh, his his bits about uh, Noah's Ark mm -hmm. and uh, the garden are spectacular. Funny, um, like they'll make you cry with laughter. They're so funny, but you know people have done that. So yeah, so I, so I, 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 I went a little bit lighter on right. that stuff. Uh, I could have done a lot more on that stuff because I think they're really funny bits. But right now, I, I do want to say just if if anybody's curious just how absurd the Bible is, uh, Chris was looking for the funniest moments in the Bible to create his book and didn't even have to use the talking donkey from Numbers. So if, if that's any indication. Uh, so what would you say is your, was your biggest challenge in writing this book? I think the challenge is uh, making his emotional journey uh, a journey, uh, creating a narrative that's not monotonous, mm -hmm. that's not super repetitive, like he just does the same shit over and over and over again. He kind of does, but – trying to find the arc of it trying to find the evolution of the story of his character um that that took some time because looked at a certain way it's like he just does mean shit from beginning to end you know he's right. just constantly punishing people that's that's it he just wants to punish so that that took a little bit of of thought yeah, I, I was really impressed with the because, you know, obviously, like you said, the Bible just offers you up so much humor on a silver platter. But I think you took a lot more than is just, you know, there easily for the taking. I, I was really impressed with the way that the story did become a story, because that's one thing that you absolutely can't say about the Bible. There's nothing cohesive about that at all. And trying to weave all that together in one story arc is, is a very impressive feat. It's not. Co it, no, it's not cohesive. And and he that was kind of the challenge. Like, how does how to take this character? And it's his book. I mean, clearly, he's the star. Of course, he's the star. He's God. It's his it's his story. But he, he's it's not obviously coherent. And uh, I, I wanted it to be I wanted to I wanted it to track. I wanted mm -hmm. it to feel like right, this makes sense that he would go from point A to point B to point Z and get more and more upset, more and more troubled, more and more his his sort of mental illness kind of spinning out and the story of Job kind of ha haunting him because he knows what a complete idiot he made of himself and the, his, his sort of deterioration culminating in uh, basically the end of, of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. basically ending with you know Babylon getting burned to the ground and him sitting up in the sky and blustering I'm just about to do my thing get out of the way I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it and he does nothing he does right. nothing you know that that's that's an amazing moment I mean the the ending of Jeremiah is not necessarily the funniest thing in the book but it is the most stark yes uh, kind of abrupt gut punch in the whole book, I think, because he's, it's just all talk, 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 talk. And then suddenly it ends and you get this kind of cold clinical finale where some other writer steps in in place of Jeremiah and says, effectively, none of this happened. Right. Like a, like a psychiatrist talking about a mentally ill patient. None of this happened. Yeah. And, and so that's the end. That's the end of the old, the old Testament story. And then I thought, okay, um, so now it's plan B. I, I got to try something else. I got to pull back and heal for a while. That didn't work. I'm going to try plan B with my son. And, you know, of course, plan B doesn't work either. And and uh, none of it's going to work. You know, if plan C is uh, Islam, you know, talking to Muhammad, well, that's not going to work either. And if plan D is talking to Joseph Smith, well, that's not going to work either. None of them are going to work. You right. know, it's never going to work. Now, I have to say, I you know, as I was going through the book, because of the way that you built the narrative, you actually skipped over Job and sort of went back to it at the end there. I was yeah. I was terrified we were going to miss out on his on that that speech. No, never. <laughs> so happy when we uh, when we came back for that one. Now, do you think uh, you know? Obviously, uh, this book is super funny to a person like myself that is really familiar with the Bible. And I wondered as I was reading through it, you know, would it still be as funny if as I if I wasn't as familiar? Well, luckily I was able to test that because I haven't gotten to Revelations yet. The Revelations part was still hilarious, but I wonder if you think that a, a religious person can read this book and still find all the humor in it. Uh, uh, 
Could a uh, Christian read this book and find it funny? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I would like to think so. I think it would depend on the Christian. I mean, s some of them would be very um, presumably angry and upset and want to send me a, you know, a death threat or something. But it is their book. I mean, that's why I'm citing passages so frequently because I did want to kind of make it clear, like, this this is your book. I'm not making up most of this right. stuff. This, this is in the Bible. I'm I'm making up very very little here. I'm connecting the dots, but I'm not making up very many things at all. Um, and I'm not making up any of the really truly ludicrous things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't know. I, I maybe a certain kind of Christian. I, what my fantasy would be a certain kind of Christian who's young mm -hmm. could read it and go, oh my. God, I've had these doubts and these feelings before, and I couldn't admit them to myself, but mm -hmm. it is ridiculous. You know how it is absurd. It is a ridiculous book. It is a ridiculous story. Come on. Well, and it's such an easy way to learn about all of these wacky contradictions because getting through the Bible is such a chore. It's a big book, yeah, and there's parts that are not a lot of fun to read, that is for sure. There are parts that are really fun to read, and then parts that are not, that are really kind of so kind of dull. A lot more of the latter than the former, I would think. It depends on the writer. You know, there are some good writers in there, and there's a lot of really, I would say, pretty flat, dull writing. Yeah. Now, it's possible that my own personal biblical lampooning experience is coloring my assumptions here, but would you care to preemptively respond to the people who will say that you just shouldn't make fun of people's faith, that that's sacrosanct and, and, and <laughs> off the table? Well, I mean, number one, obviously nothing's off the table Amen. at any time. Nothing's off the table. Um, and the more that you position yourself as something that cannot be made fun of, the more you are drawing the attention of those who want to make fun of things. Uh, the more you forbid uh, any mockery of your belief system, mm -hmm. the more you're effectively demonstrating the necessity of making fun of your belief system. I would say, yeah, that's it's, it's, it's a silly, it's 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 a silly argument. Why why should we? What does that mean to us? We don't we don't we don't agree with them. We're not being blasphemous. We don't we don't believe in their story. We think their story is ridiculous. It's we're totally free to make fun of it as much as we want. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as you prove in the book over and over again, there's a lot to make fun of in there. There's a lot to make fun of. Yeah, there absolutely is. So, yeah, I mean, even within the first page, you know, you start pointing out not just the things that are in the Bible, but obviously the contradictions that arise as soon as you start postulating this God character. Like, did he really just sit up there for eternity and then decide to make a universe? Yeah, you can't, you cannot get around it. Uh, Christians do all kinds of weird backflips trying to, they do a lot of just weird hand waving, trying to come up with some way of looking at that that makes sense. But it doesn't because either he, he just sort of popped into existence, which of course they don't believe he has to be eternal. He's God, he's eternal. But if he's eternal, well, we know the, we know that the universe isn't eternal. It's either you know, 15 billion years old, or if you're really a pinhead, it's 5,000 years old. Right. But in either case, it popped into existence, you know, it wasn't there, and then it was there. And that, and he's eternal, and, and the universe isn't. So therefore, he just sat in the dark, doing presumably nothing, right for eternally, but above the water, which is there. And that's strange, too. There's just him and him above the water, um, forever. It makes no sense, but it's great. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you what, man, I got to thank you for a really great read. And it's going to sound like I'm blowing smoke up your ass when I say this, but I honestly have not laughed that much at a book uh, since we lost Douglas Adams. I, I was literally reading this book through tears of laughter. Really appreciate it. Phenomenally funny. That's great to hear. Thank you very much. And of course, if you'd like to pick up a copy of Chris's book, and trust me, you would. Again, the, t uh, the title is The Story of God, a comedy about love and hate. It's available as an ebook, a hardcover, or as an audiobook, and we'll have links to all three formats in the show notes for this episode. That's episode 134 at scathingatheist.com. Chris, thanks again for joining us tonight. My pleasure.